the conservatives are frightened by change. And the left is enthusiastic for change and thinks it knows how to achieve it. I've been over into the future and it works, as was famously said about the Soviet Union. And they think they know how to lay down the future. We liberals are much more modest. We think there are some things in the past that are just fine, the English language, which is a spontaneous order and has nothing to do with the state. Um, and that's fine. And let's, let's carry on with speaking English. Um, but we don't know what the future will bring, but we're optimistic. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 145. And this episode is with Deirdre McCloskey, who is Distinguished Professor Emerita of Economics and of History and Professor Emerita of English and of Communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And she's also Isaiah Berlin Chair in Liberal Thought at the Cato Institute. Though Deirdre's training at Harvard was as an economist, it is quite fair to say that she's branched out as over the span of her career, Deirdre's written on economic theory, history, rhetoric, feminism, ethics, law, uh, Christianity, and more. So in this episode, though, we, we largely stick to her political and economic philosophy, which is classical liberalism and is very distinct from how the term liberal is used today, at least in the United States. So we begin by discussing classical liberalism's roots in the 18th and 19th centuries as a celebration of freedom of speech and innovation, as well as a doctrine of equality under the law. And then how this on Deirdre's view, resulted in a period of immense economic growth and prosperity. We then compare classical liberalism to competing views such as conservatism, and we finish by addressing some common criticisms of, class, of classical liberalism, such as one, I, I raise this question, is it unable to respond to crises like global warming? So do we need a big government to regulate corporations, to regulate the free market, to respond to something like global warming? And then another objection that comes up is whether or not the free market will inevitably concentrate wealth in the hands of a few and lead to massive poverty. So those are, those are just two objections that we discuss. And if you're interested in learning more about liberalism, I recommend reading Deirdre's book, Why Liberalism Works, which comes up in the course of our conversation. But it's a collection of chapters and essays that detail liberalism, both from practical and theoretical dimensions. And then it branches out from there to art, gender, and elsewhere. So Likes, comments, subscribes, as you know, I love those. Please leave reviews on Spotify and Apple. That's so helpful. And then, without any further ado, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Deirdre. Since we're going to discuss some charged topics today, I mean, political philosophy, and economics come to mind, where we can assume that many of our listeners will already have a firmly entrenched opinion. I think the right place to start is with your background in economics and history, just to get a sense of how your views evolved. So when you did your training at Harvard, what problems most interested you? Well, I was a Keynesian. I had gone to college being a socialist. And indeed, uh, Bob Heilbrenner's book, The, the Wor Worldly Philosophers, was my inspiration to switch from history to economics as a major. 
Um, and as a, a, you know, as is commonly the case, uh, a person who's not a socialist, when she's 16, has no heart. And the old joke is someone who's still a socialist at, at 26 has no brain. And I, I adjust the n- numbers to fit my case. So anyway, in, in college, what was on offer was, was Keynes. And then I um, uh, gradually evolved. Yeah, very many. Gradually got uninterested in macroeconomics, essentially, and um, became a, an economic engineer. I worked as a, a transportation economist for a while um, with John, John, John Meyer, who afterwards became the, the president of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Then I discovered economic history. And, you know, I'd gone to college thinking I'd be a historian. So there, um, that seemed to make sense. And uh, de- de- did my dissertation with Alex Gershengrohn in history, and I was still, um, at that time, a man or a young man of the left. I was against Vietnam. I was in for the, for the as I still am, on all counts uh, for the civil rights movement and for, for the women's movement. Um, but but I, I, I started to understand that economics was not as it was taught at Harvard a kind of objet d'art that you look at and, and criticize the, the the economy, and you don't and you don't expect it to work the way the models say it does. And I found that in economic history, you could actually use, say, supply and demand curves to understand historical events. I mean, important historical events, uh, the rise of the slaveocracy, and so forth. So I started to become much more of an applied microeconomist and then was hired at the University of Chicago as an assistant professor in 1968. And I didn't suffer some, you know, big, oh, now I'm going to become a Chicago economist. I gradually started to understand the Chicago arguments. And at that time, now we're talking (coughs) 1968, as I say. Harvard and Chicago were completely opposites. They hated each other. The way to raise a laugh in a Harvard classroom was to mention Milton Friedman. You didn't have to say anything about him or have any evidence or arguments. You just had to mention his name. And I got to Chicago and found that uh, you could do the same thing with John Kenneth Galbraith there. You just mentioned Galbraith. Everyone started laughing. And... I didn't like that. I didn't like that sneering assumption of superiority. Yet both sides, both Chicago and and Harvard, were claiming to the the mantle of science. We're the scientists. Those other people are uh, ideologues. What solidified my growing. Um, uh, beliefs in free market thinking was um, uh, Robert Robert Nozick's book in 1974, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which was an answer to um, another uh, famous um, famous, um, um, writer, by the way, uh, John Rawls, who was the, the, the darling of the left in those days. So I, I became a Chicago economist. Uh, um, and to this day, I think that, uh, for example, the antitrust suit that the Department of Justice is about to mount against um, uh, Google is a mistake. And betrays a misunderstanding of the economy. Um, And then at a slower pace, I gradually um, drifted further. My favorite summary of this 
is what my hero, my heroine, uh, Mae West, the great comedian of the 20s and 30s, said, I was snow white, but I drifted. <laughs> and in the 1980s, uh, having moved from Chicago after 12 years, I had tenure in Chicago, but I couldn't stand it anymore. Just they had, 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 had pegged me as part of the help. A person, and I, if I'd stayed there, I would have ended up as a dean and something horrible like that. So I uh, went to um, the University of Iowa, and there I became a humanist. I started to study Latin and got fairly far in that, and then some Greek and Italian, and most particularly got in with... Um, English professors and communication scholars. And it's in that period that I did my work, which went on for about 10 years, on the rhetoric of economics. In a way, it was trying to understand why Harvard and Chicago were so nasty to each other. Not why exactly, but in what ways they were nasty and not understanding their own, their own rhetoric. Um, and then, as I say, at, at a slower, slower rate, I kept kept up the drift. And uh, I, in, I changed gender in 19, late 1995, and that altered my way of thinking about economics some. Um, and, but it opened me up to other possibilities. Incidentally, I, I was friends with, and still I am friends with the rethinking Marxism crowd, uh, guys like Jack Amarillo, who are Marxist economists, all right, but are also like me, postmodern. And then I, uh, in 1998, I, I, I converted to Christianity, having been raised as a, as a nothing. Uh, I became an Anglican Episcopalian, the frozen chosen. And so I, I kept adding, in, in a way, it's, it's not that I hated everything that, every other way of looking at the economy that I'd known before. Although I, I have some harsh cr criticisms of um, some of the earlier versions of my thinking. But in the end, I call myself now an exponent of what I call it, um, uh, Bart, Bart Wilson, an experimental economist, calls humanomics, which is economics with the uh, with the humans left in. Well, you've brought up a, a number of concepts that are tugging at my attention, kind of like shiny rocks. Uh, the the rhetoric of economics and economics as objet d'art, for instance, uh, are really tugging at me, but I'm, I'm going to resist that. And but bef before we return to liberalism and the free market, I want to dig into one element of your past first. And you said that we're a, you were a Keynesian, and then you were an economic engineer. And economic engineering sounds to me like the exact opposite of free market liberalism. So what I'm wondering is if this was the time when you identified as a Marxist, because you've said that in, I've read that you were once a Marxist, you identify as an ex-Marxist now. So I'm wondering when you were a Marxist and what appealed to you about Marxism at the time? I was not a Marxist in a, in a, in a serious sense ever. Kind of alas, I, 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 before I went to college, I thought of myself as a Marxist and a socialist. And in, for a number of years during college, I, I uh, thrilled to that. And I, it's still, I, I, it makes me think of my youth when I, when I, well, for example, in, in that very period, I was a folk singer, um, played the guitar and sang songs. And I, what was I saying? I, I know more labor songs than any of my socialist friends. I mean, by a considerable margin. So I, I, 
I was kind of an emotional Marxist. I was not like Jack Amarillo, for example, a serious scholarly uh, uh, Marxist. Although, you know, in the time, in the period, in the 1960s, at a place like Harvard College, you read a lot of Marx, whether you liked it or not. And I, I, I liked it. Um, I read uh, the philosophical manuscripts and Capital and, and uh, you know, the, the uh, um, theses on, uh, on Feuerbach and, and so on and so forth because they were assigned. Not because I was a scholarly, intelligent Marxist. So that I haven't ever been, although I keep saying to my friends at the, at the new school, I've been saying it for, for, for decades now. Hire me because if, if you, you, you just hire me and I'll teach the kids um, a price theory. I'll teach them to understand what the free market people are saying. But they didn't, um, although sometimes they would say, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. But it did never happen. So I'm, I'm very willing to talk to Marxists, but essentially, since my mid-20s, in a way, the burden of my scholarly career has been to uh, criticize Marxism. Also, criticizing the conservative opposite of Marxism, such as in David Landis's writings as an economic historian hmm. well we'll we will hopefully get back to marxism but you just mentioned uh labor songs i was reading before we spoke why liberalism works and there you reference labor songs and john Baez in in one of your in one of your essays so i should just say right now though of course i'll say it in the introduction this is a compendium of liberalism from all angles so for those people who really want an accessible way to get into the nitty gritty that we won't just for talking for a couple of hours have an opportunity to get to, they should definitely look at why liberalism works. But now getting back to our main thread, you just mentioned humanomics, but am I correct that to the extent that you adhere to a political or economic philosophy that is generally known, it is classical liberalism. So not today's liberalism, but that which the term meant in the 19th yes. century. And, and by the way, that vocabulary that you've just used and defined is only American. Even in Canada, it's not what Canadians mean by that is what an American means by you're, 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 you're a liberal and what they mean is that you're a social d democrat. And that's not what it means any, that's not what it means anywhere else. In Latin America, liberal means, um, wanting to have laws favorable to the rich enforced by the army. <laughs> so, uh, Bolsonaro's party, shockingly, is called the Partido Liberal. <laughs> And, and whereas everywhere else, every, and, and our enemies, the Xi Jinpings and the Erdogans and the Putins and so on, they understand very well what liberalism is. They understand it, as I do, as equality of opportunity under law. And they don't want it. <laughs> they want the party to be in charge. Okay, so you, you I don't think I defined classical liberalism, but you just did as equality of opportunity under yeah. law. And no, no, no. I, I said that no, <laughs> not equality of opportunity, oh. equality of mission. Sorry, I got it wrong, not you, because we've always we we always talk about equality of opportunity, and it sounds like a grand idea, and I'd love it if it were possible, but for reasons that I've gotten a lot clearer about in the last few years, equality of opportunity is just as impossible to achieve as equality of outcome. Okay. 
Interesting. Whereas we can achieve equality of permission this afternoon. No, by just I'm sur- stopping, preventing people from doing stuff that, you know, they're stopping people. If you, for example, just to take a radical example that'll kind of startle people, I don't think there should be laws against calling yourself a doctor only if you have a state enforced um, license. I'm against that. Just as there are no licenses to be called an economist, there should be no license to be called a medical doctor. That doesn't mean I'm against private licenses, private certification. You know, you go to the nice medical school and they stamp your your approval. That's fine. That's just um, branding, which I approve of. But I don't approve of um, stopping people from braiding hair for a living or stopping them from doing what they want to do in their house and so forth. If I understand what you mean by equality of permission correctly, it's essentially that we're all equal under the law and we all have the same. Yeah, we're permitted all to do the same thing, but I'm not I'm not sure why this isn't the same thing as equality of opportunity. What are you what is the distinction between the well, two? Well, here's the problem. You and I, I take it, had good parents. Now, maybe you didn't, but let's assume you did. I know I had very good parents. I chose my parents very carefully. So I should get full credit and have a high income because of it. My father was a professor at Harvard. My mother was an opera singer. (laughs) So so I had every advantage, right? Um, uh, And I'm reasonably intelligent. I'm not any blindingly intelligent person, but I'm I'm not stupid, I guess. Um, and I'm I don't know I'm I'm healthy. This is the yesterday was my eight or eighty first birthday. All those things are the the package of opportunity. I've written a couple of dozen books and. 500 articles, 400 of them scholarly, because I've lived a long time, because I've been healthy. I know many colleagues of mine in economics or history have died young. Too bad for them. So equality of opportunity is unattainable. And in the, in the look, you are undoubtedly smarter than I am. I I don't want you to argue. It's probably true. How are we going to make you and me equal in in, in opportunity? Uh, let's pound nails into, into your head until you're as stupid as I am. Um, how are we going to get equal education for everyone? Well, let's do the Spartan thing, the ancient Spartan thing. Let's take the boys away from their mothers when they're seven years old and raise them as warriors. Okay, then you get equality in the Spartanate. But at what cost? What we should be looking for is, as St. Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, we should look for, we, we should accept the Variety of gifts is the word he uses, at least in most English translations. The variety of gifts that people have. And then we should trade. And that makes for a rich and complicated and interesting society. And it's the best way forward. And and how do I know that? Because that's what's happened in the last two centuries. This is not just a matter of political philosophy. It's also a matter of economic history. So this makes sense to me entirely. We don't have equality of opportunity when the scope of opportunity includes your parents, your country of birth, your genetics, all of these things. And you you and I were born in the United States. 
we we start out with a gigantic advantage. And I'm getting a set ahead of myself here because I would like to dig more into liberal, liberalism before we move on. But immediately, would this suggest to me uh, at least uh, an intuitive response that many people share is that then the obligation of society is to try to level the playing field so that people who are not born with the same opportunities as you or I are given them. I'm just playing devil's advocate. That just seems like an intuitive response. Look, I'm, I'm a kind of a, uh, I'm not an anarchist. Uh, my friend Wal Walter Block is. Uh, uh, Murray Rothbard, whom I know slightly was. I'm not that kind of, I'm a, I'm, I'm a liberal. And the somewhat sloppy John Stuart Mill sense. So I'm willing that you and I be taxed to pay for elementary education for poor people. I'm not, I'm not willing to pay for public schools. I think I'm against public schools. Um, that is, I'm against um, um, uh, uh, um, state control of education. But so far as financing is, is concerned, I think I should pay. So I, I'm, there's a certain amount of this attempt to level that I think is just fine. Uh, for example, easy one, um, um, uh, 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 no, um, public defenders. Well, Walter would say, no, no, there shouldn't be any public defenders. There shouldn't be any state-run courts. It should all be private, and if you have the money to buy a good good lawyer, good. Um, and I say no. I think there should be competent public 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 de defenders that I pay for. But that's <laughs> a much more modest role for the state than what actually happens in Washington or, or um, Springfield or wherever. So just to understand, better understand the argument and let's uh, restrict ourselves to public schools for the moment. So say we're talking about some rural poor community in West Virginia where the parents can't afford schooling. You think that you, as somebody who is fortunate, should be paying for the education of these children or contributing at least, but not in the form of a public school that's state funded, rather something that is privately funded. And then the question though, that this raises for me is it's one thing to think that you should pay for it. And it's great that you do, but if other people don't feel that way, then it's quite possible that it will just be a contingent fact that these children won't have the funding necessary to be educated. And well, that's how it is now. That's how it is now. That's how public schools actually work. In that Evanston, it's Illinois, a bad education. Evanston, Illinois has much better schools than the Chicago public schools. Although, indeed, the, um, the, the there are excellent schools within the Chicago public school system. But on average, and I don't need to t tell you as a Chicagoan, the public schools in Chicago, they're not as bad as New Orleans public schools once were. But they're pretty terrible. Well, I think you're, you're right. I went to a public high school in Chicago. I went to Lincoln Park High School in the center oh, of the there city. You are. And well, that's Lincoln Park. Though. Right, right. But the thing is that I went to an IB program. That was a magnet school within the school. Yep. And Absolutely. it was at the time, I don't know what it's like now. It was thought of as the most rigorous program in the city. But the people who were there for the, there were many different levels of schooling, but the people who were there at the bottom, so to speak, the, the neighborhood program, they were coming from Cabrini Green, which as you know, was a, a notorious housing project. They were not getting a good education. They weren't being, I don't think they were being educated really at all. It was more like a daycare. So I see what you're right. What you're right. Even at Lincoln Park School? Yeah. Or were they in their own school? No, it was at Lincoln Park High School. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, streaming, um, 
uh, has a long and um, hideous history in state-run education. The the story in Britain is even worse than well, not worse, but it's it's terrible in the same way it is in the United States. And by the way, I'm not a, I'm not at all against federal or state or local state. Well, maybe at a higher level, F- federal and state standards for schools. I don't want me to be paying for a what's it called a a madrasa is that the word um or a, or a yeah um, i i just learned that word recently <laughs> or for or for catholic education that doesn't include math um if there was such a thing actually the catholic school system in the old days i mean the 1940s and so on was very good compared to the public schools well i would i would just but, oh sorry go ahead yeah well th- then they stopped having the nuns to uh, run it. Well, I actually went to a, a Catholic school, just the local Catholic school for grade school. And it was actually, it wasn't academically very good, but it was a very nurturing environment in many ways, which I think is in, in some ways more important at, at that age. But just, I, I would I would still like to better understand the your thinking about schooling. So, do you you still think that somebody like you should be taxed to pay for schools, but that schooling should be like a charter school rather than a public school? Yeah. Oh, okay. That that makes much more sense that, to me. That, and by the way, that by the way is the Swedish model. Since the nineteen nineties, Sweden has had quite large numbers of of charter schools. And you can go anywhere. You can send your kid anywhere. It's like having vouchers. Okay, I mean, great. Sweden. In fact, I, I've, I've taught in Sweden a bit. And I'm reasonably f- familiar with the country, although I don't speak Swedish or any other language. For Christ's sake, I'm such a dope. I saw that you had uh, some, some basic skills in Afrikaans, actually. I have basic skills in lots of languages. I've, I've gotten to the third page. Of the of the text in practically every language you can think of, <laughs> I got slightly further in, in in Dutch, which gave me some Afrikaans, and I, as I said, I got fairly far in Latin. Although I'm still not much of a Latinist, but I'm, the great shame of my life is that I'm not good at languages. I have a Spanish joke. Want to hear my Spanish joke? <laughs> As someone who has three languages called trilingual. Someone who has two is called bilingual. Someone who has one is called una gringa. <laughs> it's especially good if it's me telling the joke because the, there's the irony of me being a trans woman and being a gringa, not a gringo, gringa, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Before we get to some of the arguments for liberalism, I'd like to dig into where it originates. And my understanding is that liberalism began with John Locke, but it's had a a storied history and, and changed much over the years. Where do you identify its most beginning or the beginning of its most important tenets? for you as you sort of adhere to it today? Well, it's, I mean, everyone says John Locke, and in standard, um, what the political scientists call political theory courses, Locke is tagged as the, uh, as the beginning of liberalism. But, you know, there, there are earlier cases. I mean, for example, um, somewhat earlier than Locke, are are the uh, is the uh, the are the radicals in the English Civil War the so called so called so called levelers and in uh, sixteen eighty five when John Locke was hiding out from James the the second in Holland, 
um, James II's agents caught a man named um, Rumboldt, Richard Rumboldt, who back in the 40s had been part of this uh, radical um, side in the, on, the, on, the, on the roundhead um, side of the English Civil War. And from his scaffold, you were allowed in English law to give a statement before they hanged you. He said, I think there is no man born of God above another, for none comes into the world with a saddle on his back, neither any booted and spurred to ride him. And that's my liberalism. Interestingly, Thomas Jefferson's last letter in 1826, a few weeks before he died, he quotes that without attribution. Tom did. Then he died. <laughs> but unlike Washington, but, but unlike Washington, Thomas Jefferson did not free even his own children by Sally Hemings when he died. I mean, the, the guy was, to put it mildly, a deep contradiction. But, the, you know, the, the, this idea that all men are created equal is, is implicit in Abrahamic religions and in and in some way of thinking about Hinduism even with even with its castes that if you since you're reincarnated you you can gradually rise to become a uh, Brahmin equal among the Brahmins so it, it this this idea that we're all equal in that sense which is a hunter-gatherer idea. It's deep in the human genome, so to speak, from the hundreds of thousands of years of Homo sapiens and the, and the other hominids wandering around in small packs. That equality is um, very ancient, but it was crushed by agriculture. The coming of agriculture created more or less instantly a hierarchy of those who could, with swords and horses, who could uh, say, so sorry, this is my land now. You must pay rent. That story that Rousseau gives about the beginning of property is essentially accurate. Um, and so you, you had hierarchy. So what liberalism is, is a denial of naturalized hierarchy. Natural hierarchies, there are some women who are more beautiful than I am, I admit not too many, and there are some people who are smarter than I am and wiser than I am. That's fine, we're, that, that we're hierarchy in the sense that there are some people much better at playing football or, or cricket than I am. But naturalized, inherited, hierarchy is to be denied. I mean, that's what distinguishes classical liberalism from the conservatism, which was its main enemy at the time. I find this idea very compelling. I'm wondering, though, just terminologically, I'm not quite sure of the distinction between natural and naturalized. I mean, maybe, I mean, is inherent another? There aren't, yeah. we're not, yeah. we're inherent, all inherent. Inherent. Go ahead. We're all inherently equal. Um, and, and we're to be, I suppose the best way, it's an interesting thought you have, The I, I, I think it, it's, it's that when you're assigned the, the old way of talking about it is um, attribution. 
when you're a lord or, or, or a lady and virtue and hierarchy and superiority is attributed to you without you doing anything, without you being good at, at tennis or, or poetry or something, just because you're a lord, um, that's, that's evil and bad, or because you have your skin is white. By saying that we're inherently equal, is that to say that we're inherently valuable? Because I can understand this notion from your Christian perspective. I mean, you already mentioned that this sort of underlies Abrahamic religions, that um, God created us all equal. But I'm wondering how you make sense of our equality from a secular perspective where we're all just or a nihilist perspective, where we're all just atoms in the void. What makes two people equal? Or maybe it's just. Well, because it's not, it, there, there isn't any naturalized, there isn't any naturalized political theory. <laughs> it, it, we have to decide to be liberals. Um, indeed, you, you can make the case that along with uh, this liberal equality from from the days of hunter gatherers, they're also in parallel and sort of in, in opposition at the same time, a, a tendency among humans to worship the leader. That's what's happening with, with uh, Donald Trump um, or other fascists. Um, it, it's, it's a, uh, so those are in, in, in tension. So you said we have to decide to be liberals. We have to decide whether or not to view all people as equal. And then presumably the decision to do this is going to be determined by both theoretical and empirical considerations. So on the one hand, just how much the tenets of liberalism uh, resonate with one person, with the person making the decision, but then also looking back on the past, how successful liberalism has been historically. Does that sound about right? Well, that, that, the, the, the last part is what I've claimed. I've claimed as an economic historian that the modern world, the modern economy, comes from the coming of liberalism. It didn't come from slavery, quite the contrary. It didn't come from, I don't know, from uh, foreign trade. It didn't even come from investment. It came from allowing people to have a go, allowing them uh, having equal permission under law to open a new store or to um, enter an occupation or to move um, and go, sit, go, go settle somewhere else. All those made for, in, 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 the, in the places where it happened, and now in most, in much of the world, uh, uh, a fantastic uh, explosion of innovation, learning how to do things better. Um, but, the, but the political decision, the ethical decision to treat other people with respect is something that needs to be learned. Or to put it the other way, you need to unlearn the kind of tendency to hate other people, um, to, um, for example, I was born, as I told you, in, uh, not, not born, raised in Boston uh, in an academic family, academic and, and theatrical family. And uh, we were um, fiercely against uh, d discrimination against uh, black people. But <laughs> we were also fiercely prejudiced against Southerners. And it's something that's just in my background. I can't help it. When I hear a person with a s Southern accent, I think, well, she's stupid, which is really stupid. Um, uh, I mean, it's really wrong. 
uh, um, and and I can't, when I catch myself doing it, I scold myself, and that's the point. It, these um, these hatreds have to be unlearned. So because they're natural, they they come up a lot. Us and them is alas how people think. Again, that may be a, a, a to do a kind of little um, anthropological psychology that may come from hunter gatherers too. Just to clarify, before I press further with this empirical thread, assuming they aren't contradictory, what you're saying is that we can't really say whether communism or free market liberalism is a better theory. What matters is what is decided by practice. Does practice show that one is better? No, no, I don't think so. I, I, well, I, I think practice does show which one is better. I mean, you only have to look at East and West Germany or North and South Korea to know that. But, but that's not the only argument. The, the, I, I believe that there's an ethical argument, a deep ethical argument. Um, a, for one thing, as you said before, it, it, it's, you can take it as a religious argument. But you can also take it as, well, I, I kind of see what you say. You're, 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 you're claiming, and I think you're right, that my arguments are, 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 are consequentialist. That is, the right life for humans is a life of liberalism. And I think that's probably true, that we flourish as humans if we accept liberty. Now, there's a pronounced tendency for people not to accept it because it's comfortable to be a child. It's comfortable to wait for mommy and daddy to take care of it. And um, so there's an escape from um, freedom that we need to, need to worry about and write novels and poetry about and rock songs and so on and try to get people to value their own liberty, um, and to and that's the best way to be a human. And and as you as you're suggesting, that's in a sense empirical. Mm -hmm. I think consequentialism is the right word there because it's quite related to utilitarianism, another uh, idea associated with liberalism and John Stuart Mill. But I'm not, I'm not a, he he John Stuart Mill. rejected Jeremy Bentham. Um, there's a, after Bentham died, there's he, Mill wrote a famous essay about his friend, um, Jeremy Bentham, and with such friends, you don't need enemies. Hmm. But, but I think that what I, you said that I was suggesting that you were saying that the right life for humans is the one of liberalism and, and that this is shown out in practice. And I think that this can be epitomized by something, a fellow Harvard affiliate of yours. Do you know, I'm, you're probably familiar with, with E.O. Wilson? Yeah. Of, yeah, I, 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 I worship the guy. Yeah. Yeah. He is, he was tremendous. I, I loved his writing, but he once said one thing. So he was a, for our listeners who don't know, he was an entomologist. He specialized in ants, though. So he was a, a myrmecologist. And when asked about communism, he said, great idea, wrong species. <laughs> yeah, that's because I've used that quote myself. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. And it captures the idea that we've just been discussing that. I mean, in theory, there's nothing wrong with communism. Um, just like in theory, there's nothing wrong with liberalism. It just might be an empirical question whether or not communism is right for humans. It seems to be right for ants, something like that, uh, or other social in social creatures, but it might not be right for humans. I uh, spoke with Nicholas Christakis of Yale, and he, among many things, does social psychology and... He wrote a book 
about successful cultures and societies and what is universal to all of them. And what's universal to all successful human societies, according to his work, is that there is hierarchy. There, it's not extreme hierarchy, but there's always some sort of mild hierarchy. And that's something that artificially, it seems, communism wants to eliminate. Uh, I mean, you have much more to say about this than I do, but competition, the ability to have incentives to come up with new ideas is one of the things that has moved us forward. Yeah, but, but that goes back to our distinction between naturalized hierarchy and exactly uh, hierarchy and so so to speak in practice um uh you you yo yo what's his name ma the the cellist plays the cello much better than i do since i don't play it at all <laughs> uh and, and so he's vastly superior to me in cello playing Although actually, I find his work kind of kind of money, but anyway, that's a separate issue. Um, so that should be allowed to flourish, because otherwise, we don't don't get Yo Yo Ma's music, and and competition, which is very often misunderstood by the enemies of liberalism, um, is simply the right to offer other people better cello playing. That's all it is. And then they say, hey, I want more of that. And then Yo-Yo Ma becomes a multi, multi-millionaire. And, you know, okay, fine. Well, I think the most important thing we can cover in this conversation, if part of our goal beyond just explicating what classical liberalism is, is to make it appealing, is to make the case for it. And that, based on what we just discussed, means going over the history of liberalism and how it's been successful. So I think the place to begin there is the historical phenomenon that you've referred to as the great enrichment. So what was this period? And what was well, it's simply role? it's simply mod, what what uh, Simon Kuznets, the great economist, called modern economic growth. Um, Simon didn't live long enough to see the real payoff, but still he was right. But there is this unique period in the last two centuries in which income increases. And I hear the figure worldwide. On average, now, then there are still poor people, but there are very many fewer than there were by a factor of 30, 3,000% above. And, uh, you know, much better medical care, wonderful, much better housing, um, uh, much better education, much better food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's only confined to the last two centuries. And you can also call it the industrial revolution if you want. But I've, I've argued that that's not a very helpful, scientifically helpful phrase, um, because it, it tends to confine it to the hundred years after 1750, for example, when, when it's, and it, and it stops being about industry. We speak of the Dow Jones industrials which includes now Coca-Cola and Google. Those aren't steam and steel. Those aren't, you know, United States steel and, and, and standard oil. <laughs> and it, it's, it's kind of crazy to call them industrials in the old-fashioned sense. But in any case, what, what's crucial here is that it's not investment. It's not institutions, as my old friend uh, Douglas North, the great, economic historian claimed it's not institutions, at least in the, under, well, the way Doug understood them. No uh, changes in institutions, nor is it, um, um, as I said, nor is it slavery as the new historians of slavery claim, uh, nor is it ex ex exploiting the 
English working class or things like that. No, 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 no. It's letting people try out things and allowing them to compete in the sense of offering them for sale to other people. And that gradual expansion of the, of the range of people who could try out things. You know, look, our country was, was started out with a substantial part of the country having slavery. Benjamin Franklin, by the way, on slaves. Um, so it, as you, you surely know, slavery was not confined to the South, but it was mainly in, in the South and at large scale. Um, so there was a whole class of people who weren't allowed to have a go. And um, that's took in the craw of people like uh, Frederick Douglass and uh, um, Henry David Thoreau as well. So gradually it expanded and half of the population were women. There's a famous uh, letter that Abigail Adams sends to John in 1776 when John is down in Philadelphia discussing the issuing of the Declaration of Independence. And she says, remember the ladies, because men would be, uh, 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 men would be tyrants if they could. And, and that gradually happened. This equality of permission was gradually extended to women. Uh, and that was a slow, slow process. Two steps forward, one step back. So it's the liberating of people that made us rich. That's the claim. And it's a, it's a factual claim. It's a scientific claim. Um, whether it's true or not is to be determined. I, I've written many books about it and and argued against the other arguments um that oh it's banking banking caused the the uh, great enrichment well you know come on no it didn't <laughs> there were banks in ancient athens um uh, no it's it's uh, the uh, trade across the atlantic no it wasn't etc well, that's exactly what I wanted to ask about, which is what other possibilities might account for the great enrichment and how you're so certain that it was liberal ideals rather than banking, for instance, or a pernicious, pernicious exploitation of labor, or it was just inevitable based on the forward progress of physics that we would come up with inventions like the steam engine or better manufacturing techniques. Because on the face of it, there are some things that would make it seem like liberalism wasn't in full swing over this period. Like our governments have bloated bigly in that time. And that is perfectly counter to what liberalism advises. That's right. Although actually the, the, the increase in the scale of government doesn't happen until the first world war. Um, uh, so it's kind of late to, to, to say, oh yeah, it's, big government that made us rich because we started getting rich in a few countries, as you know, in the 19th century. And, and the same point can be made against my friend Joe Mokir's claim for the centrality of science, the scientific revolution, which he, which he calls um, uh, a, well, he speaks of the mechanical enlightenment. There, there is deep confusion, I think, in Joel's mind and lots of others about the Enlightenment, thinking that the Enlightenment is what caused the modern world, caused us to be rich. Let's just keep to the economics. And that's just very implausible because uh, uh, a tyrants, Catherine the Great, Thomas Jefferson, both had slaves and serfs. And... Uh, um, they were among the most enlightened people in the world. So now it, 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 science comes too late. Science did, didn't cause the steam engine. It's a famous and accurate um, statement in the history of technology 
that thermodynamics was caused by the steam engine, not the other way around. It's only when you had steam engines that uh, in the middle of the 19th century, physicists started saying, now let's see, how right. does this... I've actually been this... reading a lot about this lately, so... Yeah, yeah. So, so and, and th let's just look around you at your room and ask yourself how much of what you have and how you eat and what, how much does it have to do with high science? It certainly doesn't have to do with celestial mechanics. Newton is often held up as in Galileo, and boy, that's that's the that's really what caused our enrichment. No, it didn't. That 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 you know that there's something that you arbitrarily call gravity, and you then posit an inverse square law. That doesn't help you. It helps you in shooting cannonballs a bit, but it doesn't help you in getting rich. Um, uh, think of reinforced concrete, which is the great building material of the modern era. That's not about science. So, yes, eventually, Joel's correct, by, say, 1900, a higher and higher percentage of the economy is science-based, like what we're doing right now, which there's <laughs> no question that it's high science-based. Um, and, and, but, but a lot of what we do still, a high percentage of the economy is still not science-based. Haircuts are not science-based. Most food preparation is not science-based, et cetera. So, and, and you can, uh, in, in, in my book called Bourgeois Dignity, published in 2010, I go through many of the explanations. Now, people make up these explanations six times before, before breakfast. Um, and they, they keep doing it. They keep, thinking of new things that in my friend uh, Dan Klein says it's it's um, um, he says that liberalism itself now was caused by Christianity and this is this is crazy but that's what he says and some other people do and they say that uh, the investiture controversy <laughs> in the high middle ages that caused the modern I mean at least and they keep up making up stuff. But if you just soberly think about it in engineering terms, economic engineering terms, the magnitudes that you need can only be explained by the coming of much more rapid evolution in ideas. And that you can is obvious, started around 1800s. I always use the year 1776 for obvious reasons, but around 1800, there's this immense acceleration, which then continues. Now, I don't, I don't claim I've settled this forever, but I think I've answered the question that Adam Smith posed, the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. And it comes from ideas, because the idea of liberalism, as we were talking earlier, is a novelty in the 18th century. In fact, it's scary and disgraceful, and people are shocked by the very idea that we should disestablish churches and let people uh, uh, open and not have masters. There is a wonderful remark that a cowboy makes in United States in the 1880s in Montana. He was approached by an, um, I think a German aristocrat who somehow had gotten all the way out to Montana without learning much about the United States. And apparently the 
as I as I think. The the aristocrat wanted to know who the local lord of the manor is so that he could find a place to stay that night. He, as an aristocrat himself, his uh, equal, his social equal, would g- give him room and board for the night. So he asked the cowboy, who's your master? To which the cowboy said, he ain't been born yet. So it's it's the absence of masters, involuntary masters. Look, I have a boss now. I'm back in the labor force at age 81. And I, but I voluntarily do work for the Cato Institute for pay. And at any moment, I can say, now, go t- t- take your job and, 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 and stuff it. I can walk away. Hmm. One dimension of liberalism among many that's extremely important today uh, that I wanted to cover is free speech and get to the root of it. And my understanding is not only do, do you think it played an important role in the great enrichment that I don't think we have touched on yet, but I also think if I am re- remembering cor- correctly that it discussions of free speech within the context of liberalism began in the Netherlands, which is somewhere that you have studied. I'm wondering just where it was that it entered the conversation and what was being discussed then? Well, free speech was always tied up with um, the established religion. Even in Holland, even in Amsterdam in the 17th century, you could be anything you wanted. There were certain limits on what you could say. Um, but so far as your worship was concerned, you could do anything you wanted, except that you had to conceal it. I, when, I, when I'm in Amsterdam, I, 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 I go to an Anglican church, um, and it's down an alley and hidden. It was founded in the 1690s by English merchants. One of the advantages of being an Episcopalian or an, or an Anglican is that anywhere English merchants and sa- sailors and soldiers have been, there's an Anglican church with a service in English. In any case, that's what I that's where I go. But it had to be hidden. And you could be a Catholic or a Jew or anything, but you couldn't advertise it. Um, Freedom of speech, though, be careful, because although we guarantee it in the First Amendment, at least we say the government should not do anything about it. Until the 1920s, the Supreme Court was regularly finding against freedom of speech. You have to remember the history here. The um, band in Boston was something that we, we talked about in Boston into the 1950s and 60s. Um, Ulysses and by James Joyce and Lady Chatterley's lover were forbidden to be sold, sold or mailed through, through the post in the United States and couldn't be imported. So it was only gradually fairly recently that we've achieved real freedom of speech in the United States. And think of um, a a black in Mississippi in the 1950s and before exercising his freedom of speech. Ha ha. So, yes, freedom of speech is crucial. But by the way, I just reread the other day Immanuel Kant's short essay, What is Enlightenment, from 1784. And in some ways, it's a disgraceful document. Because although Kant says, oh, yeah, people should have freedom of inquiry and they should grow out of their childhood, oh, 
of believing what he meant is the church or some higher authority. He, he, because he was a professor in the German, not because, but as a professor in the German educational system, like Hegel, later he he, he um, offered an apology, not, not an apology in the, in the vulgar sense, but a defense of the Prussian tyranny. So, uh, you know, speech, speech. Although I was just talking to my uh, friend um, and colleague here at Cato, Mustafa's um, Ecole, who's a great advocate for liberalism in Islam uh, and can't go back to Turkey as a result. He's Turkish. Um, he would be put instantly in jail. Um, and um, he and I were just talking a couple of hours ago about this. And he said, look, in, in Turkey under Erdogan, if you want to do your little scholarly work on this or that, go ahead, do it. But you can't put it in the newspaper because 90% of the newspapers are owned by the state. Uh, so, you know, freedom of speech is fundamental, and, and Erdogan understood that. The first thing he did was attack the journalists. As I said before, our enemies are not confused, as so many of our friends are, about what a liberated society looks like. They've got it right. They know that you got to have freedom of speech, but you can't have uh, governments owning newspapers, and you got to have this establishment of the church, but you've also got to let people open open businesses when they want. Well, I can I can see why allowing the sale of Ulysses or freedom of the press is good for cultural or social growth, but I'm not seeing how it connects to economic growth. So I'm wondering where it, doesn't, it fits into I don't the think it does. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. I, no, I don't think it does. I, I, I don't, you know, I can, I can imagine. Well, in, in one sense, I, I think, and I think the, again, to get back to our distinction, it's an empirical fact. That liberty is liberty is liberty. That they're connected, that they influence each other. We scholars and intellectuals, you and me, we tend to put tremendous emphasis on speech and writing. But as um, the great Ukrainian Jewish Soviet novelist, Grossman, who in the 40s was a convinced communist and in the 50s became a, became a liberal, said what ordinary people understand as, as liberty is being able to fix shoes and get people to pay for it, being able to grow your own crop and sell it. That's what's important to them. And it's that that's the main engine of a prosperous liberal economy. I can easily imagine a society in which people were free to speculate and even to write, which was economically stagnant. If that part, the part of making shoes and uh, Growing crops was run by the central plan. So freedom of speech, just to make sure that I have it right, freedom of speech fits into liberalism less as an economic tenet, but as more of a component of a broader humanist sense of flourishing. And then it's an empirical question whether it does, in fact, lead to improved knowledge production or a greater happiness or artistic sophistication or any of these things. And you would aver that it does. I, I think it probably does. And look, 
one of the great uh, German inventions was the invention of the modern university von Humboldt in 1810 opened under Prussian state sponsorship financing the University of Berlin, which for the first time explicitly combined teaching and research. Universities before, which by the way were invented in the Arab world, um, were um, uh, before then they were trade schools for the for the clergy and the doctors and the lawyers, and their job, as they conceived it, was not to create new knowledge, but to um, transmit the existing knowledge. But that wasn't what von Humboldt said. He said, we want more knowledge. We want to do research in chemistry and history and philosophy and whatever. So that, that's the great modern university idea. And that surely depends on free speech. In fact, one of the big um, problems in American academic life and world academic life, but especially in America, are the assaults these days from the left, but there have been times when it's been from the right, as in the state of Florida right now, uh, on uh, free, free speech in academic life. Yeah, and this this contrast with what's going on in Florida right now and classical, liberal, classical liberalism really makes the distinction between classical liberalism and just uh, some blanket idea of conservatism. As... That's right. Well, I'm not a conservative, but Hayek, Friedrich Hayek has a famous essay at the end of his great book, The Constitution of Liberty, entitled, Why I'm Not a Conservative. And he's not. He, he never was. When he was a student in um, Vienna after serving as an officer in the First World War, he founded with some other people a, um, a talking society, uh, a club, um, which was specifically devoted to not advocating for socialism or capitalism or Judaism or Christianity or whatever. It was a truly liberal institution. And that, that's what he was for, to the end of his life. What are then, just to make this clear, the tenets of conservatism that distinguish it from classical liberalism? And that, yeah. Ad admiring attributed hierarchy. I mean, um, about a block from the Cato Institute is a statue of Edmund Burke, a copy of one that was originally in uh, his uh, constituency in, in England and in, 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 in Bristol. Burke is a conservative. Uh, he's a kind of liberal-ish conservative, but he was a conservative. And um, he admired the, the past. Um, other conservatives, there's a modern uh, Catholic conservative named, uh, what's his first name? But anyway, his last name is, is, is Deneen. He's up in uh, Notre Dame. And last year, Harper Magazine, Harper's Magazine organized a Four person <laughs> colloquy on liberalism. Um, Cornell West, um, Frank uh, um, uh, Yamam, uh, not Yamamura, Frank, uh, Frank, uh, what's his name? Anyway, Frank <laughs> and Deneen and I were the Discussants, and then a version of, of the uh, of the colloquy was published in the magazine. And I went I, in the course of it. I said, "So you want to go forward to the 17th century?" 
He said, oh, no, 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 I'm, 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 I don't want to go forward to me. But yes, he does. He wants women to go back into the kitchen. Uh, he wants the church to take over our intellectual life. He wants, he's a conservative. He's who wrote a book, Why Liberalism Has Failed. Okay. No. Patrick is his name. Uh, Patrick to me. No, this is very interesting because I mean, so, so certainly there are white supremacists or supremacists of other sorts in Florida and throughout the United States. But I would also think that many people who identify as conservative would say that they do not believe in an inherent hierarchy. So I'm wondering. Well, I was wondering if you think it's just a peculiarity of how you use the term that this is what conservatism means or whether these conservatives just unknowingly do endorse this inherent hierarchy, or maybe there's a third option where these people who think they are conservatives but don't endorse or believe in hierarchies on any level are not in fact conservatives, but they're liberals, re liberals and don't realize it. I understand your point. And in fact, um, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm someone acquainted with George Will, who's a, who's a lovely man. And... I asked George once, George, aren't you really a, a libertarian, which is a, the stupid American term for, for liberal? And he said, yeah, yeah, I am. And George certainly is not, you know, wanting to go back, go forward as, as, as Patrick does into the 17th uh, uh, century. Yeah, they, they, but what is true is that the conservatives are frightened by change. And the left is enthusiastic for change and thinks it knows how to achieve it. I've been over into the future and it works, as was famously said about the Soviet Union. And they think they know how to lay down the future. We liberals are much more modest. We think there are some things in the past that are just fine, the English language, which is a spontaneous order and has nothing to do with the state. Um, and that's fine. And let's, let's carry on with speaking English. Um, but we don't know what the future will bring. But we're optimistic. We're willing to make um, provisions, but we're but our the basis of our suspicion of the state is that we know damn well that that um, most people in government or any anywhere where else, most of them don't know what they're doing. Uh, I, I heard a wonderful discussion the other day between Nick Nick Gillespie, who's a journalist who works for Reason, for Reason Magazine, and um, um, John Cleese. And Cleese said, um, uh, "The uh, what, what? Why am I bringing this up?" Um, well, Cleese is a is a is a liberal. There's no question about it. And then he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I remember." He had a um, collaboration with a. I think it was some sort of brain scientist for a while, and he, he and the brain scientist wrote a book. And he came to admire this guy very much, this other, this co-author, and said, what do you, what percentage of the people who practice brain science, in your opinion, know what they're doing? And the guy said, well, about 10%. And Cleese said, in the interview with uh, uh, Nick. And, and every time I ask this question of other people, 
In other fields, they all say about 10%. And I would say that about economics. About 10% of the self-declared economists in the world know what they're uh, doing. 90% are stumbling around in the dark, as we all are to some degree, I admit that. So we're going to hand over the economy to a bunch of people who don't understand what monopoly is or don't understand the business cycle and can't predict it. Huh? I think this 10 and 90% number is a bit too optimistic. And I don't think it's just, it's not, it's not just economics. I, I mean, the best writers or the best philosophers or the best basketball players, the, the best is a very, very small percentage. If, if the best is what is salient to us. Um, but I find this modesty of liberalism very attractive. Th this idea that rather than try to engineer the future or stick to the past, the best bet is to trust that an ethical society responsive to competition will lead us to a better outcome than either the engineering or the resisting path. Yeah, and, and one needs to preach this. We need to keep people from falling right back as they want to do into this childish position. Look, we all come from families, and if we're lucky, we come from good families, from, from loving families. So we all start as socialists because that's what a family is and should be. Uh, from each according to our ability, to each according to his needs. I, I'm wholly in favor of it in a family. I think if you take the family analogy, as people are always doing, both the conservatives do it when they say, well, men should, should govern women because, the, the, or the king should govern us all because the king is like a man in the family, the, the, the husband should be the master of the woman and all that kind of talk. That's the conservative talk. But on, on the left, the talk is, oh, yes, we do family planning, not just in the, in the sense it usually is, but we, we plan things out in the family, and that's how we should do the economy. And it just doesn't make any sense at the level of a family of 330 million people. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be charitable and should care about the earthquakes in the Atlas Mountains or something. I, I think we should care. We should help people out when they need it. Um, but um, it, it's indicative of how bad states are that the Moroccan government right now as we speak is preventing some countries from sending help to the Atlas Mountains. It's literally stopping people who can help. And I'm afraid that's the way of governments. Most governments are hard tyrannies. I mean, in the world, if you look over the whole world, the percentage of the population that's governed by in a wholly arbitrary and tyrannical way, the world population is very high. And we can hope that we can persuade people, if we preach enough, we can persuade them to, to um, rebel against this and say, no, no, I want to be a liberated person. Hmm. I think that one of the most important things we can do with our remaining time is talk about some of the criticisms of liber liberalism and why they are wrong, if they're wrong. And I don't know if there are any in particular you think are worth bringing up, but one that immediately comes to mind is that a class classical liberal prefers a small government with low tax rates. But I think one of the responses is that are not high tax rates on some level extremely useful to society as a whole and that they go to improved infrastructure, support for the impoverished, a robust military and so on. And the people that can afford them should be forced to pay those taxes. For well, the, the answer is no, as you'd expect uh, to me, me to say, but it's not just 
Again, I, you know, I'm an economic historian. I'm a liberal. I'm an amateur political philosopher and a professional economist and a, and a professional historian. And I bring this history to the fore. And the, the gigantic governments we now have um, are just, I mean, it's pretty obvious, they're way above the optimal level. My, a cousin of mine said to me once, which, which she ar ar articulated something that's in people's minds, I know it is. She said, well, look, a complicated modern economy needs complicated modern regulation and intervention. And I said, no, Annie, it's the opposite. The more modern and complicated an economy is, the less one should depend on explicit top-down um, guessing of what people on the scene, both consumers and uh, and, 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 and sellers are doing. Um, Consider, 55% of the marketed output of France goes through the government, 55%. In the United States, it's not small. Add up all levels of government. In the United States, it's about 40%, which is still very, very high compared with what in both countries it was, say, before the First World War. Um, Half of the French, 55% uh, goes to buying things, paying the salaries of university professors, buying airplanes, uh, by buying uh, jets with guns in them. Um, the other half goes to subsidies. Well, one that I'm a beneficiary of in the United States is... Uh, Social Security. Um, and in France, there's a very similar system. Or to pay for, um, um, well, actually, that, that's on the buying the, the buying goods and services side, buying health care for people. And if, if I thought that those were good systems for achieving, or how, how to put it, one way to put it is to point out that um, say the American healthcare system, which is a terrible mess, um, uh, is not doesn't work very well for for poor people, for instance, and for rural people. Um, and it's it, it's because we it's got the government in it at all different levels, all in all kinds of ways. The Democrats are very proud of their finally being able to achieve recently allowing Medicare to bargain with the American drug companies, which they claim probably correctly will bring down many drug prices. I mean, see, it's crazy that Medicare was set up in a way that it couldn't bargain with the drug companies, but that, that's, that's part of the problem. But a non-interventionist policy would bring down drug prices in the United States 80% tomorrow. If we prevented the, if we said, if the government stopped preventing people from buying drugs in Canada and Mexico, Drugs in Canada are 20% as costly as they are in the United States. This is a result of a big government. It's stupid. So, you know, and it's, it's, I, I always get angry and shout at the TV when uh, they talk about how wonderful it is that now Medicare can bargain with the drug companies. It's just gotten out of hand. It's just too big and way too big.
I guess the you only hear in the news about particular cases, and I guess I'm thinking of EpiPens prices jumping super high once they. Um, I mean, I think the patent was purchased by somebody, so they just jack the price up very high. Or Martin Shkreli. Well, I'm against patents. You're against patents. Of course, I am. Is Every real liberal is against patents. Then and what's copyright. to protect intellectual property? Or where's the reward in inventing something? Intellectual property is a terrible idea, invented by lawyers to increase their uh, their incomes. It's an incredibly stupid idea. Look. If we could assure constitutionally that you could have a patent for, I don't know, 10 years and a copyright for 10 years, I'd have no objection. But the trouble with both patents and copyrights, not trademarks, that's another matter, but patents and, and, and copyrights get longer and longer and longer. As you know, that's the trick in the drug industry. Add a hydrogen atom or, I don't know, some more neutral atom to the previous chemical formula and then go get a patent for that. Um, by the Mickey Mouse Protection Act of 1998, as it was called by economists, the, uh, the copyright in the United States, I hear this, is now 70 years after the death of the creator. So Walt Disney's copyright was extended 20 years over the absurd 50 years it originally was as a result of the Walt Disney Corporation going to Congress and purchasing it for a surprisingly low price and getting the what, what honestly people in the field call the Mickey Mouse Protection Act of 1998. Patents and copyrights it ought to be more widely known that they were both invented by the Venetians many centuries ago. Now, the Venetians were brilliant and coercive monopolists. If you, as a glassblower, skilled glassblower, went to France and started to teach the French how to do Venetian glass, in, say, the 16th or 17th century. The Venetian state would send secret agents to France, kidnap you. <laughs> That's amazing. Bring you back to Venice and stick you in the lowest prison, the lowest cell under the, the palace of the Doge. I never heard that. <laughs> this These were not nice guys. This was... The whole system of intellectual property is a ridiculous idea. Look, from the economic point of view, the opportunity cost, let's take an easy case, of another person reading Hamlet is zero. It's true of the with Brooklyn Bridge, too. As soon as it was built, the, the social cost of one more person crossing the bridge is zero. So the correct allocative price of crossing the Brooklyn Bridge or reading Hamlet should be zero, or using the Mickey Mouse image should be zero. Now, as you said, somehow it's got to be provided, but that's rather easily handled if it were not the case that this stuff get, always gets bigger and bigger and bigger, longer and longer and longer. In fact, most industrial inventions, most improvements across all, on average, across all industries are either not patentable, right? Mathematical theorems, for example, are not patentable, or can function as trade secrets for a few years until the other people reverse engineer what you've done and copy it. And that suffices. It sufficed through the 19th century. There's an awful lot of silly talk about 
patents being the source of economic growth, and they're not. Um, across the 19th century and modern times, as I'm saying right now, most innovations are um, not protected by patents. I guess I, I just see the, in the... So one of the main incentives of liberalism in the free market is that the freedom to innovate is rewarded and restricting ourselves to the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, if you come up with a drug, it's yours to sell because without that incentive, then people will not pursue the sorts of innovation that would result in economic growth. I, I guess I don't see why you disagree with that. No, that, 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 because I'm an economist. Okay. And I know that the opportunity, when opportunity cost is zero, the correct allocative price should be zero. That's what I say. And it's a, you can prove it on a blackboard. Um, and uh, um, of course, if there is an opportunity cost, then it's vital that it be, have, be charged. So land can't be free. If we make land free, as government land in the West is essentially, then it'll be overused under, uh, it'll be badly allocated. And that's, that's elementary economics. And um, so when there's an opportunity cost of, of use, yes, you should, it should be charged. And indeed, as you said, it won't be used correctly. The person won't be given the incentives. Now, as far as innovation is concerned, as I just told you, most innovations are protected by secrecy in process. If they're, if they're process innovations, you devise some little machine that does a better job of bottling or something, and you get an advantage until someone sneaks into your bottling plant and takes a photograph of what there is, and then you lose it. This, this panic about the Chinese stealing our technology is extremely irritating. The Chinese are very poor there, even though they've done very well economically since they stopped, since they adopted capitalism, which is what they did um, after 1978. The, we want them to get richer, not because they'll buy more of our stuff, but because ethically we don't want people to be poor. I want, I want the innovations of the great enrichment to be spread all over the world. And um, this, this idea that, oh, how terrible it is the Chinese sneak into the factory and take, take photographs, that's, that's just complete status rubbish. It's, and it's unethical. And it's, as I said, it's an employment scheme for lawyers and, and state bureaucrats. So I, as you can see, I'm just contemptuous of this argument, even though you hear it every day on the, uh, on the TV. Well, here is the last objection I'll raise, and I think it's quite existentially, existentially compelling right now, uh, and that's global warming. I mean, if it ha if the consensus is to be trusted, then the free market has brought us to the brink of serious catastrophe that to prevent requires serious regulation. And maybe you just deny climate change, in which case well, I guess it's a non-starter. Don't, don't, don't assume I'm an idiot. Um, I, I don't, I don't deny climate change. You, you, that's silly. Um, yeah, all you have to do is look at this year's temperatures to know that that's not true. Um, and I'm concerned about it. Who wouldn't be? But to say that it's existential is to follow the um, emotions of a of a Swedish schoolgirl. I won't characterize her anymore. Um, and this is not sensible. Look, if we let economic growth happen, it goes, according to the World Bank and other um, believable estimates, it increases world real income about 2% a year, which doesn't sound like much. 
except that in a century, that's a factor of eight. Average income in the world is about is about fifty dollars a day right now. In the United States, it's uh, upwards of one hundred uh, of one hundred and thirty dollars a day. Um, eight times fifty is four hundred. There is no country in the world now that has an average income of four hundred dollars a day. Um, what's going to happen? <laughs> is an enormous increase in the number of engineers and scientists who can handle the problem of global warming. Now you'd say, oh, well, how do you know? I am I told you, I'm a liberal. I don't know. But as a liberal, I also know that the other people don't know. If they were so smart, they'd be rich. They don't know. They don't know. The, the Federal Reserve doesn't know how to run the business cycle. Um, Swedish schoolgirls don't know what's whether the world is coming to an end or not. Uh, and in case after case, if we stick with environmentalism, environmental problems, Letting people try stuff out, not top down. Let's make sure we do it with uh, windmills. None of that stuff. We let people try things out. They've solved it. When I was young in Boston, my mother would wipe the sills on the, on the window in the morning because they had dust from the soft coal that everyone burnt in the wintertime to stay warm. In the evening, she would wipe the sills again. We were breathing uh, particulates worse than the worst cities now in China or India, right? And we solved it. <laughs> now, there's a role for the state here. Um, namely, forbidding people to use soft coal for heat. And even anthracite, which is hard coal and doesn't smoke as much. That's good. That's okay. Then let people find out ways to find substitutes. The trouble with the... Um, uh, extreme environmentalists is that they think that they already know. They're on the left. You could also call them conservative in another sense, but they're on the left, and they think they know how to lay down the future. I say, let people try things out. Now, by the way, this is how much of our life already works. I mentioned the English language. The English language, or the French, or I don't know, Chinese, is a spontaneous order. There's no government making it happen. There are no regulators. The French Academy <laughs> tries to stop Le Weekend and Le Parking and so forth. And this, this, this is crazy stuff. But they, and they fail over and over again. There's a French word, I can't, don't remember what it is, for computers. But <laughs> on every French lip is... It's Lord de Nature. The, there you go. There you go. You, you got it. And no one uses it. It's completely stupid. The, and why not the economy? And yes, there, there's a problem. I don't think it's ex existential. I think that's, that's silly talk. If we allow the economy to grow, if we stop industrial or great enrichment, if we stop the great enrichment worldwide, then we're doomed. Then we won't have the millions of new engineers and scientists to uh, solve the problem to, you know, and then there are st straws in the wind like um, carbon uh, capture fueled by um, ge geothermal energy and I don't know, Iceland and Hawaii. Um, there, there are 
things we can do. We, we can we, we can move to other sources of energy, but we but we can't be we can't get some person in Washington making this decision. The overall parameters can be set in Washington, but then allow the market to work. Well, Deirdre, the last thing I will ask today is something that I am just going to assume is a topic that is close to your heart. But I mentioned your book already, Why Liberalism Works. One of the chapters or essays in it is titled Liberalism is Good for Queers. And I just wanted to ask, sorry? Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to ask why that is, because I think if I were to take an informal survey, most uh, queer people that I know, at least, would say that they're uh, contemporary radical left, which is far from uh, classical liberal. They are. And they're and I, I argue with them all the time. And I say, dears, it's sort of like the the uh, the, the um, some of my feminist friends again, believe the state is going to help them. And I say, say, have you noticed that the men run the state? I've seen the Barbie movie twice, and everyone's got to see the Barbie movie. It's a terrific liberal document. Even I'm not at all sure that the, that the author intended it to be, but it is. Um, uh, the 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 free market opens um, dance halls for the boys and girls to dance with each other. The free market leaves people alone or tries to find stuff that they want to buy. It's the state that ran in Northern Europe only, not in Southern Europe. In Northern Europe only ran the hundred year old. 100 year, the, the century of uh, attack on male homosexuals um, from the 1870s to the 1970s in Germany, Scandinavia, Holland, England, and offshoots. Um, as you know, people, I, I, I know personally, people whose lives were ruined by these laws. Um, in France, Italy, Spain, Greece, the church was against it, but the church didn't ever insist that it should be against the state's law, that you should go to jail for being queer. They, they didn't do it. Um, in fact, um, uh, Pope Francis has formulated it right now in exactly that way. He says, well, you know, it's, it's maybe disordered desire, that stupid stuff that they, they talk about, but, but it shouldn't be punished. And that's right. So it's the state that's the danger. And I don't know why people can't get through this. Many of my le le left-wing friends believe that the corporations are the big problem. Um, if you ask uh, people on the left what causes inflation, they say, ah, the greed of the corporations. And this is just, just insane. It's governments that cause inflation by printing too damn much money. It, it, as Milton Friedman said, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon because the price level is the inverse of the price of money. That's all it is. Uh, so it's what, what, what is very strange is that people are terrified of shoe companies and this largest um, this largest thing of all, the modern state, they embrace. And I wish they wouldn't. I wish they'd understand. When the when the drag queens fought the cops in New York, 
on that fateful evening. By the way, it wasn't the muscle men fighting the cops. <laughs> it was the drag queen. So you can imagine the police being hit with purses. <laughs> uh, um, um, the, what they were, what the police were raiding was a private club. Private. It was private in the sense it was a, a profit-making enterprise. So come on. Um, I say to my women friends and queer friends, don't expect the government to save you. They're not going to. It's not going to. Well, Deirdre, when I when I first reached out to you to be on the show, uh, you said you would be happy to balance out some of the fashionable lefties. And I'm glad that you let me take you up on this. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Thank you, dear. I, I in, in enjoyed it. Sure. You know, I really believe in free speech and freedom of the press and so forth. And, and one of the reasons I believe in it as an academic, as a scholar, is that when you talk in the way we have, in a calm and sensible way, I sometimes get excited, but and when, when we trade ideas and we listen to each other, we learn. The old proverb is, there's a reason God gave us two ears and one mouth. I agree with you entirely. So again, thank you so much. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart.